Hi, I'm Dave Miklos. I'm here at the Hall of Human Origins at the DNA Learning Center of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And I'd like to welcome you to the second episode of our series, What DNA Has to Say About Our Human Family. Today, we're gonna to be looking at ancient ancestors, particularly Homo erectus, the Neanderthals, and the Denisovans. But before I get started on today's exploration, I need to go back in time and fill you in a little bit about what we did yesterday. For those of you that were here on the previous session, it will be a review, but for those tuning in for the first time, this is essential information. We started our exploration the other day by asking the question, which animal has greater genetic diversity, chimpanzees or humans? And we said that in order to answer that question, we would have to use DNA as a sort of molecular clock to go forward and backward in time. And the basic idea that we need to know is that the DNA molecule, which I have a simple representation of here, can be changed by a process called mutation. And basically what happens in the mutation process is that these rungs of the DNA ladders can be changed. So for example, this orange rung here, which represents the chemical cytosine, could change into, say, this blue one here, which represents thymine. So changes can occur to the four rungs of the DNA ladder that make up the sequence of DNA. The key thing to understand is that mutations in DNA happen one at a time, not all at once. They happen at a more or less constant rate over evolutionary time. And so that over time, mutations in DNA accumulate. And we can count the number of differences in mutations between different organisms or different individuals. And the fewer the mutations between any two individuals or groups, the more closely related they are. The more mutations that you can count between the DNA of two different groups, the more distantly related they are. We also introduced the concept of a DNA lineage where you have the progenitor of this lineage at the top in white, and then going down in each generation, there may be a change where the white DNA that we began with encounters a change, such as the red that you see on the left, or the blue and green and yellows that you see on the right. As you go through time, and, and sample the DNA, which is represented by the line, present time, you can actually see a record of the mutations that occurred over time. So for example, in the red and the white line, you can see those two mutations in the twisted pipe cleaner. And on the other side, you can see the several mutations that occurred green to yellow twisted together in that pipe cleaner. There's different ways that we can study DNA diversity. Many people are familiar with the nucleus of the DNA, nu nucleus of the cell, which contains most of our DNA. But the compartments outside the nucleus called the mitochondria also have their own DNA. And in many cases, it's easier to study. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They make the energy that's needed for the cell to carry on life processes. There's thousands of them per cell, so it's a rich source of DNA because they have their own DNA that's shaped like a circle. Uh, another thing that I didn't emphasize in the last session, but I'll emphasize now, is that mitochondrial DNA is inherited only through your mother's line. That's really great because that means it doesn't recombine or mix up with any male DNA. And it represents a clean, more or less pure line of descent from mother to daughter to mother to daughter. And here's how it works. When this sperm encounters an egg cell and fertilizes it, none of the sperm cell DNA enters the egg. However, the DNA sequence of the mitochondria is passed on from cell to cell. And you can see in this lineage where females are circles and males are squares, 
that the DNA is passed in a lineage from grandmother to child to child. And you'll see that the male offspring of this mother carries his mother's mitochondrial DNA, but does not carry it forward in time in his lineage. And by the same token, this male that comes outside of the lineage does not bring DNA into the lineage so that you can trace this lineage of mitochondrial DNA from grandmother to daughter to child. I also told you that finding the DNA to do a mitochondrial DNA analysis is really quite simple. We can rinse our mouth out with saline solution or take a swab with a Q-tip. And that will give us some squamous cells that you'll see in pink there, which are a, a fine source of mitochondrial DNA. And the hundreds of cells that we obtain that way are amplified by a process called PCR, which we went over a little bit yesterday on the other day. And then finally, they're sent off for DNA sequencing, where the sequence of the DNA ladder rungs are determined precisely the sequence of A, T, Cs, and Gs. Those sequences come back to a tool that we have online called BioServers, which is a simple bioinformatics tool. And then we can analyze the DNA. And remember that what we did was we displayed two, the sequence of two different living humans, in this case, someone from Germany and Japan. And we just compared in a row the sequence of their mitochondrial DNA. Wherever the DNA is the same, you'll see a T here and a T here, a T here and a T here. But where there's a difference between the two sequence, sequences, it's highlighted in yellow. So in this case, the German sequence has a T, whereas the Japanese sequence has a C. And we can count the number of differences over a stretch of mitochondrial DNA, about 400 rungs of the DNA ladder long. And we can compare them also to chimpanzees. And what we noticed is that the average number of difference between any two modern humans was about seven, and the average number of differences between any two chimpanzees throughout their range was about 30. So we concluded that there is much more genetic diversity in chimpanzees than in modern humans. And here's a complicated tree where the great, 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 great grandmother of this whole lineage is here, and at the branch of each branch of the tree, is one individual, either a chimpanzee or a human. And you can see there were thousands of hum humans and chimpanzees in this study. And if we label it, we'll see that all the groups of chimpanzees from across the belt of equatorial Africa represent most of the variation in this tree, and modern humans represent only this small fraction. We mentioned that when Africa, when the African climate dried out about two million years ago, the rainforest across Central Af Africa was fragmented into the current groups of rainforests that you see here and where the chimpanzees currently live. Chimpanzees spend most of their times in the trees, but they do come down to the land at times. And when Africa dried out several million years ago, great plains and grasslands opened up, habitat for many, many new animals, including our forebears, who most certainly evolved in Africa. And those are the forebears that we'll talk about at the beginning today. The big question has always been, if modern humans arose from ancient ancestors in Africa, and there's lots and lots of anthropological evidence, skulls of many of our forebears are found throughout Africa. It's clear we came from there. But when did our ancestors leave Africa and populate the rest of the world? In particular, when did they get to Asia and Europe, which are considered the old world? And we know that the new world, the Americas, was populated much, much later. So the question is, when did our ancestors leave Africa? 
Well, here's a representative of who we are now, Homo sapiens. And we know that from anthropological bone evidence and other evidence tools, that modern humans came into being about 300,000 years ago. And the earliest evidence comes, in fact, from North Africa of modern humans, Homo sapiens. But a key figure in our ancient ancestry is Homo erectus. It's very clear that Homo erectus or its very near relatives were our direct ancestors. And they came into being about two and a half million years ago and then went extinct somewhere about 200,000 years ago, or perhaps they came forward even more into time, but it's not clear. So Homo erectus arose in Africa. And another ancient ancestor that has really fired the imagination of humans for a long time is Neanderthal. It lived from about 600,000 years ago and became extinct about 35,000 years ago. So a key question has been, were the Neanderthals ancestors of modern humans living today? And part of the reason why that was such a compelling question is the remains of Neanderthals and their habitations can be found throughout Europe and into Western Asia. And here we have the range of the Neanderthals. The map's a little unclear, but here we are, Spain here, England, across France, and over into Turkey, and also into Western Russia. So Neanderthal ranged widely throughout Europe during its time and went extinct about 35,000 years ago. So it was very plausible that Neanderthal could have been the ancestor of modern humans, especially living in Europe today. Now, behind me is a Neanderthal skeleton on the left and a modern human skeleton on the right. They look pretty similar. The Neanderthals were pretty tall. They had a bigger rib cage, which, they, which we think was made them adapted for cold climates. They had relatively heavy bones. But the key thing is, if you look at their skulls, the Neanderthal in my left hand and the modern human in my right, you'll see that Neanderthals had big skulls, meaning big brains. As a matter of fact, the average human brain, if you filled up this space here, this sort of oblong space, the average human brain, uh, the average Neanderthal brain was in fact a little bigger than the brains that we have. So the key thing is, if a big brain means more or less the ability to do things and to reason and to think, Neanderthals had quite a good capability to do probably many of the things that we do today brain-wise. Well, there are, set there, especially up until recent times, there were competing theories about when our ancestors left after Africa. And it led to opposing theories of human evolution. I'm going to run through the two prevalent ones, and then we're going to do actually a test of those two theories with DNA. Remember, <clears throat> a central figure in all of these animations that I'm going to show you is Homo erectus. He was clearly an ancient ancestor of ours who originated in Africa, and you're going to see Wayne ranged widely across the globe. So here's Homo erectus originating in Africa, coming out of Africa about a million and a half years ago, and, and populating parts of the ancient world in Asia and up into Europe. And all of this occurred hundreds of thousands of years ago. So Homo erectus was very successful at walking around. He was the upright man and woman. They migrated out of Africa into many parts of the old world, Europe and Asia. Now,
One theory says that Homo erectus, all this happened with Homo erectus. So there's Homo erectus. And one theory, which is called the multi-regional hypothesis, suggests that modern humans arose from the Homo erectus people that were already there in antiquity. So Homo erectus came out of Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago, and modern humans underwent a sort of parallel evolution where different groups in Europe and Asia arose from the ancient Homo erectus stocks. So that's one theory which is called the multi-regional hypothesis. Now a totally different theory agrees that Homo erectus was there, Sorry, I didn't advance my slide. Let's try the next one. So the third theory agrees that Homo erectus was in the ancient world in ancient times, but a second group emerged from Africa much later, about 60,000 years ago, and then went into Europe and Asia and ultimately across into the new world. The key thing is, is the timing in this proposal, which is sometimes called out of Africa or the recent African origin. Key thing here, Homo erectus did come out of Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago, but a much more recent group that were our ancestors came out of Africa just about 60,000 years ago. And the question is, how could you ever figure out which of these two theories might be right? And the answer is, you can look to DNA. The first key experiment that really started to answer the question between these two competing theories was done in 1997 by Svant Pabo, who is now at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. He, he was the first to obtain a mitochondrial DNA sequence from a Neanderthal bone, and it was actually from the type specimen, the original specimen collected of Neanderthal from the Neander Valley in Germany. So first he had to do an experiment just like the one we did in the previous session, which was the to determine what's the extent of modern DNA diversity and then how does Neanderthal fit into it. So what I'd like to do now is to work on a DNA lineage as we did before. Let's go back to the bioinformatics tools. I'll go online now and do this an analysis in real time with you. We're gonna repeat some of our work from the previous session. So I'm gonna enter this facility called Sequence Server. I'm gonna collect DNA by going up here into manage groups. And I'm gonna work with some DNA of some students who looked at their mitochondrial DNA about a month ago. And I just need to find this person. I always have trouble finding this person. There we go. Edmonds Community College outside of Seattle. So I'm gonna move their DNA samples. I'll zoom into this just to give you a little better view of things. First I need to, uh... so what I'm gonna do is compare any two students from this class in outside of C Seattle. So here's student number one, and here's student number two. I align their DNA. And what you'll see 
is on one line is student number one, there's 50 nucleotides of sequence, and here's student number two. So you can see where their DNA is perfectly matching or perfectly aligned, there's no differences. Here I can zoom in, I have to be careful with the zoom because it doesn't work well on the other page. But if I zoom in now, what you'll see is I can go through the sequence here, this doesn't count, this is sort of nonsense, but I come into the sequence and I can see that between student one and two, there's one difference. And the sequence ends down here. These ends means that it can't be determined. Let's compare another pair, which is student number one versus student number four. Go into the alignment. And again, look for the differences. And I see one, two, three differences. And if I compare another student here, bring in another student, student five, and com compare student five to student one. I see one, two, three, four differences before I hit near to the end. And I'll just do one more uh, sample. I'll do student number seven versus student number five. Sorry, I have three there, so let's get rid of that one. And I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 differences. So what you can see is there's a very variable number of differences between any two students. And I can go into the database very quickly and pull up some other samples. from a database. And what I'm gonna just pull up is some uh, modern human DNA. And I'm just going to take Africa and Asia, just and Europeans for starters. I'll move them into the workspace and now I'll quickly compare student number five versus someone from Greece Again, I come into the sequence. And I count one, two, three, four differences. I'll do student number five versus someone from Japan. Come into the sequence. One, two, three, four, five differences. And I'll just do one more. I'll do student number one versus a Kung Bushman of the Kalahari Desert of Southern Africa. And I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12. Well, what Svan Pabo did in the original research was to do about a thousand pairs of modern humans. I did, you can see, seven or eight, but imagine doing that a thousand times. And he found that the average numbers, number of differences between any two living humans today was about seven. And you can see that that was the range that we came up with between one and 12. And we would have, if we did this even over just 20 or 30 sequences, we would come very close to that average of seven. So the key thing is, is that seven equals the extent of the var variation that accumulated in modern humans since we arose about 300,000 years ago. So seven mutations on average between any two people equal about 300 thousand years of evolutionary time. So now we ask the next question, which is how about Neanderthal? 
And we had sequences from Neanderthal beginning in the 1990s, the first done by Svant Pabo, and then additional ones came on board. So all I need to do now is to bring Neanderthal into this study. So I'll go into the database. I've got to just zoom out here for this. I'll come into the database and I'll look for Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. We have a whole set of it. There's, uh, you can see seven or eight sequences. There's new ones all the time, but we have a few there. I'm gonna move a few of them into the workspace. Here's the original one from, from Germany. Here's one from Russia. And I'm gonna take also one from um, Spain. So I've just taken three different Neanderthals. Maybe I'll take a couple more just in case I want them. Okay. So now I've become a little more complicated here because I have several things on my workspace. But let's get rid of the Kung Bushman and let's compare. Here's our student from Edmonds Community College, student five. Let's stick with that one. And let's compare student number five to the original Neanderthal sequence. Let's come into the sequence here. Zoom in a little bit and let's count the number of differences. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Let's do that Neanderthal versus another student, student number one. Same analysis. Zoom in a little bit. And let's count the number of mutations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And let's pull a different Neanderthal in now. Let's do one come, coming from the Caucasus in Russia versus student number five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Okay, again, we could do more and more pairs of a Neanderthal and a modern human and build more and more data. But the data would tell pretty much the same story, which is, there's on the order of 25 or 30 or 35 differences between any modern human and any of our Neanderthal samples. So what does this mean? Let's come back to our slides for a second. Oh. What about Atsi the Iceman, maybe you can just pan. We have a model of Atsi the Iceman right in the room here with me. Cameraman's not happy about this, but there's Atsi the Iceman. He's about 5,000 years old, a mummy found in the Tyrolean Alps of Europe. And the question is, what about Atsi the Iceman? How many differences would we see between Atsi's DNA and ours, we can do that experiment too if we just come back one more time and add him in. So if I come into I should have Otzi's sequence here. 
I should have pulled him over earlier, but somewhere on here is Atsi. There he is. Okay, so now I've moved Atsi over into the workplace. And let's just, what would you think about Atsi? He's 5,000 years old. Will he look like a modern human or will he look more like the Neanderthal sequence? Let's think about that, but let's do it. Here's Atsi versus uh, student number five from Seattle. And if we take a look here, student number five and Atsi, one, two, three, four. So let's just do one more. Let's do Atsi uh, versus the Japanese person just to cement this. Here's Atsi versus someone from Japan. One, two, three, four, five. So remember, we said the average human variation between modern humans is somewhere around seven. And you'll see that we came up in that range when we compared modern humans to Atsi. Well, it shouldn't come any surprise, but 5,000 years is no time in DNA time. So Atsi is fully modern. His DNA, his anatomy, the diseases he had, the problems he suffered <clears throat> were all pretty much the same ones we had with the possible exception of COVID. So let's do one more analysis here and then come back to our theories of evolution. This is another way of analyzing DNA. It's a different bioinformatics tool that we made here. It's called DNA Subway. Now, what I'm going to do here is start a little project on ancient DNA. And I'm going to tell it that I'm working with mitochondrial DNA. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in that class uh, from Seattle again. So I just have to come into the sequences here and find it. I believe it's on page three. There it is right here, Lazarus Hart, Edmonds Community College. So what I'll do is I'm not gonna take all of the sequences, but I'm gonna take several student sequences and I'm gonna add them to my DNA analysis project. Um, and then I'm going to start this project. Well, I think I'm also going to take some Okay. I actually took a different set, but that's fine. Let, let's, let's just start over one more time here. Ancient DNA, I'm gonna take the sequences again from Seattle. I'm going to select just several of the student sequences. I'm going to add them to the project. And now I'm just going to create this project. OK, now I'm going to add to the project some Neanderthal sequences. To do that, I have to come into the, well, I have to do just one step there. Now I'm going to add some reference data, and here I have some different data. I'm not going to use it all, but I'm going to take some of it. I'm going to take some African sequence, uh, sequences. I'm going to take some Asian sequences. And I'm going to take some European sequences. And I'm going to take some ancient sequences. Great. Now, what I'd like to do 
is build a tree. I've showed you some hypothetical trees made out of pipe cleaners, but let me show you a real DNA tree made with DNA data. So I'm just gonna come into the data that I've assessed or amassed here, and here are the student samples from Seattle, and I'm gonna take all of them in the analysis. Uh, I'm gonna take some modern human samples from Asia. I'm just gonna take two because it can become a little bit crowded if I do too much. But there's a sample from China and one from Korea. I'm gonna take a couple of the um, Neanderthal samples. I'm gonna take Otzi. I'm going to take a, a European, a couple of Europeans. I'm going to take it from England and Iceland. And I'm going to take two Africans, one Yoruban from West Africa and one uh, Algerian from North Africa. So now I'll save those samples that I've put into my analysis. And now I'm gonna do a sequence alignment like we saw in the BioServer tool, but it's in a different tool and it has an entirely different look. I think you'll like it. It's a little more complicated, but it's also in color. So now I have an alignment between all of my samples here. Here are the samples here and here's the DNA. It looks a bit weird because you'll see these big blocks here. And what these big blocks mean that there's no sequence in those samples. Some samples have a very long sequence like this, and some have much shorter. As a matter of fact, this Chinese sequence is so short that it's cutting off some sequence we can use. Because you see, I could use all of this sequence except the Chinese one. So I'm gonna actually go back and kick that one out of the um, analysis because it will make things clearer. So I'm just gonna now resave it realign the DNA minus the Chinese sample, which just happened to be a shorter one. And now I can view this, good. Now what I need to do in order to build a tree, all of the sequences have to be of an identical length because otherwise the algorithm that makes a tree will start interpreting these nothingness as differences. So what I'll do now is just trim all of these align sequences to get the central part where they're all where they all have sequence. And now you see it's a much shorter sequence. I can zoom in and you can take a look at it. I'm, uh, and what you see here are the DNA mutations that are different from person to person. You can see some sort of patterns, like here's the Neanderthals down here, and you'll notice they have a sort of a different looking barcode, almost like the barcodes you see in a grocery store. And the groups up here, the modern, they have uh, certain affinities also. But watch when we now make a tree out of these data. So the algorithm will go through and interpret the relationships and interpret them as mutations happen, happening one at a time, as we mentioned before. And then how, could have those, how can we account for those mutations with a tree going back in time? And here it is, it will build it very quickly. And I just have to set one thing here, which is, I just have to make the tree do something here. Actually, that didn't really help very much. So let's just try one more. Okay, so now here we have a tree. And it's not a perfect tree, but what you'll see, here's the ancestor of all of the females in who are in this analysis, of all of the mitochondrial DNA that's in this analysis. Here's the ancestor going way back in time. 
and then each time you can see there's a branch. The key thing I want you to see here is that all of these branches here are separate and they are all Neanderthals. And then the human part of the tree comes down here. So as we said in a simple way, the number of mutations that we saw between a modern human and a Neanderthal, 20 or 30, was outside of the variation of modern humans. In other words, Neanderthal cannot be a direct ancestor of modern humans, otherwise Neanderthal would be within the variation that we have. In other words, Neanderthal would be within this part of the tree if we were related to him. Because you can see all the other modern humans are grouped together. So what this says to us is that the multi-regional hypothesis where ancient people in Europe, including Neanderthal, gave rise to modern Europeans and perhaps Asians cannot be correct according to this analysis. Because according to this analysis, Neanderthal is outside of the genetic variation that is shared by other modern humans. So Neanderthal couldn't have been directly related to us, but certainly is a cousin. And we certainly share an ancestor far back in time. Well, we have two more analyses that we'll try to do today. Well, the number of mutations that separate humans and Neanderthals, it's actually, if you do it uh, fastidiously, it's about 28. How many years does that equal? Well, DNA time isn't exactly correlate very well with paleo paleontological time or what the bones say. But roughly, we think that if this is humans here and these are Neanderthals, that we shared a common ancestor about 600,000 to 900,000 years ago. So there we go. 28, here's the Neanderthals branching off from modern humans. We had an ancestor farther back in time and it was about 600,000 years ago. There is a cave in southern Siberia called the Denisova Cave, and many Neanderthal remains had come from that cave. As a matter of fact, we might have an analyzed some of the mitochondrial DNA from one of the Denisovan Neanderthals. During the dig there, they found lots of remains, not just whole skeletons, including they found this tooth. And they did analysis on this tooth and one other tooth and one other bone eventually, and were surprised that the sequence didn't match Neanderthal. And so in fact, there was another ancient human mixed up in the remains in the Denisova cave. So, Let's take a look and analyze that DNA and see what it has to say about where it is in this whole mess of human evolution. So what I'm gonna do is come back to this analysis here. Remember, here's the DNA subway. Um, I just need to go into the reference data again Oh, I think it, actually it's there. I'm going to come into the select data here. And I think that Denisova is here already. There it is. There's two sequences, one from a tooth like the one I showed you and one from a bone. I'll just take the tooth since that's, that's what we looked at. And I'm going to add now the Denisova DNA to our analysis. Do the same thing the multiple sequence alignment, which will align all of the DNA sequences that we've analyzed. There, they're all aligned. I just need to trim these outside areas. And 
And there's the sequence. And you can see the differences, the mutation differences between all the different organisms. And now let's make a tree. This tree, I'm going to make the Denisovans sort of as the what's called the outgroup of the tree. And now let's take a look. It actually makes a really beautiful tree because to make the best kind of tree, you need something that's distantly related to everything else. And in this case, the Denisovans, what you'll see is that the, the, the Denisovans separated first from this whole lineage. So here's the great, great, great thousands of times grandmother of this group. The Denisovans come off and we believe that we shared a common ancestor with the Denis Denisovans about a million or 1.2 million years ago. Here's the Neanderthal sequences all clustered together beautifully as you would expect. And then Here's all the modern human sequences, including the students from Seattle, here, 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 and here. This is about the same tree that you would see in a textbook because it clearly shows that the Denisovans were another ancient ancestor separate from the Neanderthal that goes back further in evolutionary time to a common ancestor and then, of course, if we go back this lineage far enough, we'll come to Homo erectus in Africa. I have one more kind of analysis. Oh, and here's a tree that I put in a book. It's a slightly outdated, but it's pretty identical to the one that we generated using the data. And the key thing I want you to see here is that there's now good evidence that there was mixing of DNA between Neanderthal and modern humans and even between Denisovan and modern humans. About several percent of the DNA of any person is derived from the Denisovans or the Neanderthals. And we can find that bioinformatically. The final thing I want to leave you with is an entirely different analysis. It's out of the range, mainstream of what we've been showing today, which is how did humans evolve and move across the world. This one, this one is an experiment that everyone does, but it gets at this question of, of my late friend Marcello Siniscalco, which is, Knowing that we have a shared ancestry is the best inoculation against racism. And let me show you how this works by doing one final set of experiments. What I didn't tell you is that if we sequence your mitochondrial DNA and you do this experiment, I'm just gonna get rid of some of this, and you do this same experiment and you have some classmates or some family members or whatever, what do you think is the first experiment that you'll do if you have your own mitochondrial DNA sequence? You're exactly right. You're going to compare it to people who you think are like you. Maybe your friends in your group, maybe your family members. So let's just sort of do this by going back into the database I just cleared this workspace off to make it simpler. Let's just got to zoom out here for a second. So let's come in and get our class again from Edmonds Community College. And let's also get African samples. Oh, I didn't move them. Sorry. Let's try again. Okay. So 
Remember I said that the first thing someone in this class is likely to do is compare it to their friend. And let's say that person one and two are friends and they're going to compare their DNA and they're going to see that there's just one or two differences. After a while, they get tired. Most people will get tired of comparing DNA to the people who seem like them or who are friends with them. And they'll branch out and do other things. And what I want to do is show you something that's very paradoxical. I can't be sure, but I'm assuming that probably these students are Caucasian. Now, if we're not exactly sure, it doesn't matter. The key thing is, is that they're here in the United States and they're not in Africa. So let's take now, what I'm going to do is take two African samples. I'm going to take a, a Yoruban and a Kong Bushman. So that's a person from West Africa and a person from Southern Africa. And I'm going to compare them to the student. Sorry, I didn't click them all off. I'm doing a three-way comparison now. Now, when you do a three-way co comparison, at any position, two of the people will have the same sequence and one will be different. And so what I want to do is to take a look at this. Now, what you might expect is that where, where there's a difference, that the, your, that the person, the student from Seattle would be different from either one of these two Africans. That's my hypothesis, and I would guess it would be the hypothesis of that student. But let's see if that's the case. So in each, each case, we're going to say who is the same and who's different at that position. So at this first position, the student is the same as the Kong Bushman, and the Yoruban is different. In this case, the student is the same as the Yoruban, and the Kong is different. Here's the student and the Yoruban, 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 Here's a case where the two Africans match. But here again, student and the Yoruban, the two Africans, Kung and the student, the Yoruban and the student, the Yoruban and the student, and the Yoruban and the student. So out of about 10 places, the student matched with one or the other of the Africans more often than the Africans matched each other by a long way. Now you can do the opposite of this, which is you can take two students and one African and do the inverse of this. This might in fact be, have been the first thing that might have been tried. So again, we're looking at who, which two are the same and which two are different. At the first position, the students are the same. In the second position, the students are the same. In the third position, the student and a Yoruban. In the fourth position, the students are the same. So in that case, the students were more similar. However, if I take perhaps another student or if I take another African, I'll get a slightly different story. So this sequence isn't quite as good, but in this case, I have the Algerian and one of the students, the Algerian and one of the students, the Algerian and one of the students, the Algerian and one of the students. So again, I wish that I knew exactly the background of the students, but the point I want to make to you here is especially when you do the experiment with two Africans and a non-African. So let's just try the Algerian 
Um, or let's even try two Kung Bushmen and student number six. So here, here's two people from the same group in Africa. And what you'll see is that they're very closely related. And in fact, the two Kung Bushmen in this case have the affinity with each other most of the time, all of the time. So the point I want to make is that when you do these comparisons, you can never know exactly what to expect. But very often, if you compare a person of European or Asian ancestry with two Africans, you'll actually find the two Africans are different at a position from the Asian or the European. And what we're seeing here is that in Africa where we arose, the populations of humans were quite large throughout our history. The diversity continued to develop there throughout that time, and that we see the greatest diversity among African populations. And what we see in general, that the mutations that we have in Europe and in Asia are a subset of the mutations in Africa. And the reason for that is the ancestors of modern Asians and modern Europeans and everyone else came out of Africa. And when they did on those small migrations, they pulled out some of the diversity that was in Africa and took it with them to different places around the globe. So I hope that you've enjoyed this analysis. I hope you have an idea about where modern humans came from, how we evolved from ancient hominids like Homo erectus and how we related to Neanderthal and the Denisovans. And if you join me in the next installment on Friday, I'll talk to you about human populations. We'll look at a different genetic system and a different mutation and what it has to say about our human family.